Hey guys, John here. Welcome back to the series, How to Use Pigments. This is video 38, and today we're talking about envelopes and a little bit of modulation with those envelopes. There's going to be a separate modulation video by itself because it is a deep topic and requires a separate video for that because modulation in pigments goes very deep. So with that being said, for this demonstration, I have an analog engine with a saw wave, and that's pretty much it. So we have our different tabs down here. So by default, we're going to be greeted with our envelopes. So for example, we have three envelope VCA, two and three. Now they're basically the same, except the only real difference is that number one is going to be hardwired to your amplitude, as we can see here for the voltage controlled amplifier. Now that means that this retrigger source here is going to be grayed out and permanently selected as poly keyboard, which means that once we hit a note, this is going to trigger this envelope here and we cannot change that. We can on the other ones and we're going to get to that, but with that being said, let's take a look at this uh, at these controls here. So we have our TAC, which let's briefly go over the envelopes because I believe you should be familiar with envelopes by now. But if you're not, our attack is basically the time it takes once we hit a note until it reaches the maximum amplitude. So let's drag this up a little bit to maybe 171. So it's going to take 171 milliseconds from the moment we hit a key until the volume reaches its maximum amplitude. And then from there, it's going to start entering the decay phase. And an easy way to think of this is the fade in time. That's a more layman's kind of term to think of the attack time. And then once we reach the attack time or the attack value up here, then it's going to automatically start going to the decay. Now the decay is going to be this right now, this horizontal line going from the attack to the sustain point. So this distance right here and the time it takes to make it from point A to point B is going to be determined by the decay knob. As we move this here, we can basically tell it how long we want this distance to be. So for this example, let's do 1.21 seconds. And once we hold our note, it's going to sit here at this node and it's going to wait. And this value here is going to be sustain, which this sustain knob is the only real odd one out of this whole envelope kind of thing, because this one is not measured in time, but more so in value. And in this case, volume. So if we bring this down here, let's do something quite low, quite obvious. Let's see what happens. It's going to wait there until we release the note. Once we do, it enters the release phase, so the fade out phase, the opposite of our attack. And we can increase this knob here so we can have a longer fade out time, a longer release phase. So hopefully that makes sense there. The next thing we should talk about is the curve. So this is additional contour of our sound that we have available to us. Now this ATT curve is going to be the attack curve. So we move this and we can see how the attack curve changes because sometimes when we're sculpting different types of sounds, the curves definitely matter. You got to be a curvy guy, you know what I'm saying? You got to look at curves. So with that being said, we can go convex or concave depending on your needs. So let's bring the release down a little bit. And you can tell how this curve drastically changes the sound. Now, the same thing is true for the decay. So we can move this curve here quite a lot here and change the value there. Kind of a steep fall off here once it goes linear for a while. Now you might be wondering, okay, this is cool. We have the attack curve, we have the decay curve, but what about the release curve? Now the way to change that is this little small button here that has these chains over here, this linking thing. Once we select that here, now this decay curve is gonna control the curve for the release and the decay simultaneously. However, keep in mind that this also controls the decay time and the release time as well. As we can see this decay now, as we move this here, we can see the release move as well, but it is grayed out. So we cannot interact with it here. We can't click here and move this. We have to control it with our decay right over here. So hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory there. And let's uncheck that and put all our stuff back to default by double clicking these, uh, these, not, these knobs here. Now, the last thing for this is going to be the ADSR, which we are doing right now, the attack, decay, sustain, and release. Now we can change this to ADR and it basically removes the sustain out of the question for the most part. So before on ADSR, we hit a note and it hangs out at the sustain level. So let's bring our decay out and bring our sustain down like this. Now I can hold this note all day and it's gonna hang out at the sustain until I let it go. And then it enters the release phase. The difference being here on ADR, if I hold down a note, it's just gonna go through the envelope shape. It's not going to wait at the sustain point while we hold down our key. It's just going to run its course. 
Now that doesn't necessarily mean that's, that this sustain knob is kind of useless at this point. This is going to be more so a point of reference how to draw the curve because it's going to automatically go through this curve regardless, but wherever the sustain is at, at its value, that's going to be the line it's going to follow. So we can see how that changes the sound of the decay, even though it still runs its course. So even though it's ADR, the sustain still plays a valuable role, and that's determining where in that value it's going to be because it changes these lines here. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense here. Now, something that we do need to talk about is going to be this retrigger source. As I mentioned before, this one is hardwired. We cannot change the one for the VCA, but we can for two and three. So let's take number two and an easy modulation thing now new with pigments four is we can drag this here and let's drag this all the way to our cutoff because it's something easy we can hear and that we can see. Okay, great. So with that being said, we have envelope two modulating the cutoff of our filter every time we hit a note. Now you might notice every time we hit the note, the envelope triggers and draws its shape that influences the cutoff. Perfect, okay. And that's because it's on poly keyboard. So our polyphonic keyboard is going to be the trigger source for the envelope to start drawing its shape. The same case is with mono keyboard as well. We hit our notes and the envelope will draw its shape. Now if we select legato keyboard, this becomes a little interesting because we hit some notes. Okay, it draws its shape, that's fine. Now for this example, let's go over here to legato mode and you don't have to select the legato mode here specifically for this to work. It just makes this demonstration a little bit easier to see and understand and all that. So we hit our notes, our envelope draws as normal. Now when we hold a note and then play additional notes, that's not gonna cause the envelope to re-trigger. So drag out our uh, envelope here so we can hear it a little bit more. Let's use ADSR actually here. So we can see individual notes, the envelope two is gonna still, still draw its shape, but if we hold down the note and press another one, it's not going to be redrawing its shape every single time. So moving on from legato, we have sequence start. Now for sequence start to work, we need to turn on the sequencer. So this is fine, some eight steps, some C's, whatever. Slow this down just a little bit. Now we can see over here on the synth, once we press a note, we see our envelope activates. Now you might be wondering, okay, why doesn't it keep repeating? And that's because this is only on the sequence start. Once we hit a note to initiate the sequence, then it's, the, it's gonna tell the envelope to draw its shape one time, and that's it unless we start playing the sequence again. Not repeating the sequence, but playing the sequence again. Now let's say for example that you want this envelope to be re-triggered for each individual step of this sequencer. Now that we can do that with the sequence clock. Now once we select this here as the re-trigger source, this filter is going to move because it's being triggered or it's being controlled by the envelope, which is getting triggered by the sequence clock, which is each individual step here. So basically the easiest way to really understand this is we have this envelope shape and we use it to modulate a certain type of control or a sound or something like that, some knob over here on the synth, but we do need to, to tell the envelope when is it appropriate or what do we want to have trigger this envelope. And this is gonna be our menu here of stuff that we can say, this is what I want to start the envelope with. So if we go to LFO one here, for example, and we're not even hitting notes, but we can see that our envelope is just getting triggered. And the reason for that is we go to our LFO tab, which we're gonna talk about in the next video, However, this LFO here, every time this first one starts redrawing its phase from the beginning, then that's gonna tell envelope two to start drawing its shape. So envelope two is waiting for envelope or for LFO one to start and then envelope two can now draw its shape. So with that being said, if we play a few notes here, starting off our sequencer here, So you might be noticing that it just sounds like a regular envelope on the cutoff. And you are right, the only weird differences here is that 
whenever envelope two needs to draw its shape, it's looking for this retrigger source, and this is LFO one. Okay, got it. We go to LFO one, and this is going to be drawing its shape and then triggering LFO two. However, what's triggering LFO one? And we look over here. Oh, okay, it's the poly keyboard. So every time I hit a note, the LFO is going to start from the beginning, which then tells envelope two to draw its shape. It tells the filter cutoff to move. So it's kind of like a signal flow, signal flow process. And it's a cool way to understand that saying LFO one is getting triggered by my keyboard. And then once that gets triggered, it triggers envelope or uh, envelope two. And then that triggers the cutoff, the value that we have modulated. It's a little bit of a lot, but once we kind of wrap our head around that concept of what triggers what, then it can get really in depth very fast. And the same thing kind of works as well with the uh, other trigger sources, so like functions and randoms. But while we're here in LFO one, we can also increase the speed here and we can now start seeing this is automatically moving our cutoff. We can see this is all drawing because LFO one is going very fast and every time it starts, it draws envelope two's shape. So moving on from that, we can change LFO one to function one. So now this function is going to be telling the envelope two to draw its shape. Same way as the LFO, once it goes to the top and restarts, it's gonna tell the envelope two to draw the shape. Now we can also change that with the random. So we go over here to the random, which we're gonna have separate videos of all these, but every time this, or this gets a new value, it's going to change this cutoff because that's getting controlled by, LFO, or by envelope two. So as you drag this right down, we notice that we're gonna have a lot slower triggers for our envelope. So we have one over there. Let's bring it up a little bit faster here. So now one, one. So every bar, it's basically going to draw this envelope shape. And it's kind of cool because you can do this rhythmically if you want to, totally up to you. But that's basically the concept of how this triggering works. Now, LFO one, two, and three, function one, two, and three, and random one, two, and three, all function the same way. You just have different versions of those. Now, another cool one here, these last ones here are envelope uh, or engine one grain trigger and engine two grain trigger. So let's go to engine two because right now we're using engine one as our analog sign or saw wave. So engine two, let's go over here and we have it selected here. So if we press a note, okay, nothing's happening. So we're like, okay, uh, engine two grain trigger. Okay, so we're in engine two. Oh, we need to turn it on, right? So we turn it on and still nothing. You're like, okay, this is kind of weird. Okay, so Oh, we, are, we need to turn on granular, so we turn this on, and chaos ensues. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with the granular video that I've done before, this should make sense to you. On this density knob here, as we drag this down, now this density knob, these, these, uh, these grains are basically going to be triggering this envelope to start drawing its shape which is really a fascinating concept if you think about it, that these individual grains are now telling the envelope to draw its shape and that's telling now the cutoff to move. So the grains and the filter are now in sync with each other, which is very awesome. And you don't just have to do the, uh, the filter cutoff. There's so many options that you can modulate things with and then so many options to trigger those modulations with. So hopefully you're starting to kind of see how in depth this can be. So if we turn this off here, let's go back to our analog and put this back to poly keyboard. The way we did this uh, automation here is, or this modulation, we dragged this envelope to and dragged it over here and then just dropped it on. And then now this value here is going to follow this knob here and kind of increase or, you know, if you want to go different directions there, if you'd like to do that. So with that being said, we can always double click this and then move our mouse away and it'll remove that modulation. That's one way to do it. You can also hover over the knob as before and click the plus, and then we can kind of just manually drag how much of that influence we have here, as we can see up here, how that's moving right over there. So that's kind of cool that we can do it that way. And like I said before, we're gonna have a separate video on just modulation because it can get in depth because we can have this being modulated, but we can also ha we also have the side chain. And we click this and we're greeted with this whole hu huge menu here. And we might be like, this is a little overwhelming. What's kind of going on here? How does this all work? So like I said, we're going to have a separate video on that because this is this is a deep topic. So yeah, with that being said, that's basically how these uh, envelopes work in a nutshell. So hopefully you learned something. And in the next one, we're going to be talking about the LFOs and some of the improvements that they've made to make it a little bit more user friendly. So thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.